Welcome to Life Stories with me, Des Tong. On this week's show, Carl Jones talks to the man who created history by winning the first Oscar for a James Bond film for sound editing on Goldfinger at the Academy Awards in 1965. But despite working with many of the movie industry's greatest directors, he turned his back on the Hollywood lifestyle to move to the West Midlands, retraining as a plumber at a college in Birmingham. Here, Carl talks to Norman Wanstall. Well, Norman Wanstall, thank you so much for joining us at Big Sense no, it's TV my pleasure. and allowing us to have a first here on the channel, which means we've got an Oscar in the studio. Yes, you have, yes. We'll get to that in a little minute. OK. Um, but first of all, just tell us a little bit about how you first got involved in the movie business, your first exposure to the world of cinema. That's a very good question. It was, uh, you know, I believe in the old saying that life is based on luck. <laughs> and it just so happened that the grammar school I went to was co-educational, and one of the girls there I got friendly with, her mother was a, uh, had a very high position at Pinewood Studios. And one school holiday, she said to her daughter, get a couple of friends and I'll take you around the studio for a day. Well, for a 14-year-old lad, to go around a film studio in those days was just like a, an experience you couldn't describe. Like a kid in a sweet shop, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Films were our life because there was no television and so on and so forth. And it was a memorable day and you were walking down corridors and passing film stars, you know, famous people. All along the walls were the paintings and photographs of very, very famous people. But the highlight was to actually go onto a stage where they build the sets and actually watch the hero, Alan Ladd, rehearsing his lines for a film called Hell Below Zero. And I just stood there, I just couldn't believe I was watching this, this guy rehearsing his lines. Anyway, the whole day was amazing. And so when I finished my national service, I was just waiting for interviews. I didn't have any real, in, real direction. And I thought, well, there's no harm done. I could write to that lady and see if she remembers me. And to my amazement, she said, yeah, come and have a chat. And that's the rest is history. So you had a chat. And, and, and the, 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 the move into the sound side of the business, was that how did that come about? Was that always what you wanted to do as soon as you got a foot in the no, door? No, well, the thing is that when you think of the film industry, you always think of being on the set with cameras and sound crews mm. and, and actors. So when she shoved me into this very small room with a guy in the corner running film through a machine, I was a bit disillusioned. But I thought, I'll give it a try, find out what it's all about, what is he actually doing. It was a big come down. I really did imagine I was going to be in a place like this with lights and cameras. Mm. But, you know, after a while, I began to see what was happening. Every time they said to me, take the film up to the projection box, and I would look through, and I'd realise that each time I took them up there, the film was beginning to grow and grow and grow, and I realised the film was being built by an editor. And when that began to... When I absorbed that, I became really very, very interested because I realised how creative it was. Mm. But throughout my three-year contract, sometimes you would be assisting an editor, a film editor, and sometimes assisting a sound editor. So over a period of three years, you had a very good insight into the two sides of mm. film editing. And of course, most people outside the industry don't realise that sound and picture are completely separate. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you made your name, really, on the early Bond films in the 1960s, the yes. first one, Dr No, 1962. How did you get involved in that? Well, it was pure chance, really. That at the end of my contract of three years, they, they said they were going to renew it. But a couple of guys took me to one side and said, you know that there are freelance people out there that don't want to work in a studio. And the, there's a legend called Winston Ryder, who's a very difficult man to work with, but he is the king when it comes to sound editing. He's looking for an assistant, and we think you would be absolutely right for him. And of course, being young and adventurous, I, I took the job. And we worked on three major features. John Paul Jones, Solomon and Sheba, and Sink the Bismarck, yeah, the which Bismarck, was edited right. by Peter Hunt. Who became one of the, the main editors of the Bond films in exactly. the 60s, didn't he, and directed one. So, exactly. so Doctor No, then, I mean, people will probably find it difficult to, to imagine the sort of world back then. There's some pretty futuristic sounds, even in that first yes, Bond you're film. you're absolutely right. We've not got the technology that you know we, we've got now. How do you go about finding you know, nuclear reactor sounds and things like that? Yes, it, it was a huge challenge, really. What was so strange was that because Dr. No, the budget was so slight, so small, so tight, that we couldn't follow the normal pattern of when you finish shooting, you normally, on a film of that size, you hire two soundtrack editors, one who concentrates just on the dialogue, they work with the actors, bringing the actors back into a studio like this, and they replace their sound. And then um, you had the sound effects guy who, who is solely responsible for all the noises, all the guns and the cars and the planes and everything. Mm -hmm. 
But Peter Hunt said, we can't afford to, so the, the thing is, we've got to promote you to sound effects editor, which of course was absolutely That's unheard of. Your point of view, that, isn't it? And I, not only was it a huge uh, promotion for me, but also a very difficult film to work on. Mm. And th what I noticed was that the sound department at Pinewood Studios, as soon as they saw the rough cut, they couldn't wait because they knew it was going to be a huge challenge. Mm. And so many of the sounds in that film I made or created with the sound mixers way, way before the final. Mm. Yeah. And, and that sort of set the, the, the benchmark, didn't it, really, for the Bond films in the 60s, which were ahead of their time, always sort of yes. pushing things. So, of course, the, the crowning moment of your, of your career was winning the Oscar yes. for Goldfinger in 1964. Let's have a look at the moment that you received it from oh, okay. none other than Angie Dickinson. None, none well, less. why not? The winner is Norman Wonstall for Goldfinger. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult to say thank you as sincerely as I'd like to now. But I'm a technician, so maybe I can leave the eloquence to the artists that follow. But on behalf of the sound departments that I've worked with and my production company and myself, may I thank you all very sincerely for this tremendous honor. And what's more, may I thank you for the opportunity of coming to your wonderful country. I think for my wife and I, this trip is gonna be the greatest experience of our lives. Thank you very much indeed. So Norman, you went over to, to the Oscars ceremony. Um, more in hope than expectation. I know you, you said that to me before, you know, not really yes. realising what was going on. But when you look back now um, at Goldfinger and the fact it's, it's held up as one of the, the greatest Bond movies. Yeah, that's true. Those iconic sounds are such an important part of it, aren't they? With Odd Jobs hat and the, yeah, the laser beam. Yeah. How do you start coming up with things like that? I know. It's, it's a difficult one to explain to people that aren't within the industry, but because I'd worked with that legend on three major films, he never actually taught me anything, but I watched the way he operated. And so when I was finally left on my own, I found that all the techniques that he used were rubbing off on me. And one of the techniques that I noticed he did, he always said, never try and create difficult sounds in one go. Record lots of little ingredients that you think will contribute and then go in with a sound mixer and you can have lots of choices and you can mix them together. So, so something like that whoosh of odd jobs hat. Yes, that was a very good example. How many different elements would be in something like that? How many different elements? Well, different I can sizes? think of three, but there were more than that. But I, I remembered, I remember saying to my assistant, go around all the toy shops and see if you can find two toys because I remembered them from my youth. And one of them, I won't go into too much detail, but one of them was just a, a disc made of cardboard and string was placed through it in such a way that when you pulled the hands apart, the wheel spun. We loved it as kids, you know, it was such fun doing all this whoosh. whoosh and he did find one, I was really surprised, mm. and we recorded that, and of course that gave me the basic <laughs> There was also another toy we had, which was a, a piece of metal that was twisted all the way up, and a, a small propeller with a hole in it was put on it, and it worked its way to the bottom. And then as kids, we used to push that propeller up to the top, and when it left, it would spin through the air and we recorded that. So you're literally, you know, you've got a portable recorder and you're recording all these sounds. The guys no followed it with their computers. mics. Yeah. Yes. And then, and then there's like a twanging noise to it as well, isn't there? Well, that? the sound when it left the hand I knew was absolutely vital because it had to have the threat of metal, otherwise people wouldn't know what it was made mm. of. And we tried all kinds of things and in the end I said, let's get a, the ordinary wood carpenter saw and put it on the edge of a table and see if we could twang the end. And as soon as we did it, we knew we'd got it. And do, do you know that many? Do you think that's it? That's yeah, the sound? Yeah, you know, that's the sound. So, you, so Bond films of the 60s, then you worked on films like The Ipcrest File. Um, but at, at what point were you starting to think, actually, I fancy a completely different career direction? Well, originally, I, I, what's so ironical is that I always wanted to be a film editor, which was why when I met Peter Hunt, even though I was with this legend, I said to Peter, is there any chance that I could become your assistant? Because I'd heard that his was leaving. Because I wanted to become a film editor. And by uh, working with Peter, he gave me lots of chances to assemble scenes together and so on. And one day I had a phone call from the legendary 
a pop singer called Mike Sarn. Mm -hmm. Does that ring any bells? Uh, you don't, actually, yes, yes. <laughs> he said, I've heard about you, and I said, well, I've heard about you. He said, I've made this little documentary in the south of France. If, you, if you'd like to look at it, I'd really appreciate it, because I have no sound on it. Is there any chance you could help me? I did help him for free, and he said, if ever I get a chance to direct a film, you will be the first person I'll ring. And that's a perfect moment to take a break right we'll find it we'll come back in, in two or three minutes and find out what happened with that <laughs> offer and why Norman actually ended up then moving to the Midlands and retraining as a plumber See you in a few minutes Welcome back to Life Stories on Big Centre TV. I'm here with Oscar winner Norman Wanstall. We were talking before the break, Norman, about yeah. sort of how it, your career is evolving. You've been given an offer. You've been speaking to Mike Sarn. Sarn. What happened then? Well, I, when he said that he would give me a chance to edit a film if ever he directed one, I thought it was a bit of a laugh, really, for a pop singer to say a thing like that. But by some chance, about a year later, he was offered... Yeah, he wrote a script called Joanna, gave it to 20th Century Fox. They said they liked it because it was swinging 60s, and he was given the chance to direct it, and he gave me, gave me a chance to edit it, and that was the set start of my film editing career. Mm. I edited about six films altogether, and I've thoroughly enjoyed that side mm. of filmmaking. But I spoke to my wife about it because I'd worked abroad, I'd worked in Israel and places like that, Germany, Denmark. And I thought, I don't know if this is the right way to continue my life for the next 25 years. So you, were, you were based in London at that point, where you were sort of presumably whizzing around from a one lot studio of film, to another. Yeah, a lot of our work, work because we, with the editing, you, all you need is a room. Mm. You don't need sets and stages. And so, for some reason, we kept ending up in Soho, and I was riding a motorbike from Surrey up to, up to Soho. And I began to think, I think, I'm not sure if this is the way I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, especially with the uncertainty of it all. You never knew when the next job was coming from. So, so you did a complete about turn, really. Yeah. Ended up here in the Midlands. Yes. Living the good life. Living the good life, so, yes. So, um, so, I mean, how we did you adjust? It. How did, you, was it, did it take a lot of well, adjusting? Well, we, we, we didn't just do it uh, without thinking about it. We researched it greatly. And my daughter had always wanted a, a pony. My wife, obviously, had had enough of the film industry because I was never there. We had a baby son. And all we needed to know, really, was, A, where we were going to find a place with land because mm. we would need it for self-sufficiency, and, B, what was I going to do for a career? So I researched it, and I found that there were courses run in those days called TOPS courses, Training Opportunities. Mm. And I thought, well, this has got great potential because they paid you a small sum to learn and over a period of time you could become a qualified tradesman. It's a bit like apprenticing of these yeah. days, yeah. So, so you, you could, and you, so you, you came to Birmingham, was it college in Birmingham, wasn't it? And, it was, yes, it was and college up, in Birmingham. And took up plumbing. You must be the only Oscar winning editor, <laughs> film editor, who's ever become a self-employed plumber. The only self-employed plumber in the world with an Oscar, yeah. yeah absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And but I loved it, I enjoyed it. I, I'd always been quite a, a, a good DIY man. It wasn't as though I was throwing myself into mm. the unknown. And I, when I went to various uh, train, uh, well, which you might say, uh, places that gave you advice on careers, mm. they all tried to put me in offices, and I said, no, I want to work with my hands. Well, because in, in a way, what you were doing in the film business was yes. very practical, wasn't it? So, yes. So, so you showed... Very creative and... In those early years, did you ever think, mm, have I done the right thing? Did you miss the film business? No, no. You, it's strange. you attempted back once, weren't you? Just once, yes. I often look back and wonder if that was a good idea. I think financially it probably was, because... So that, was, that was the uh, Never Say Never Again, Never Say it? Never Again. Of Sean Connery, so... Yeah, it was. How, how much of the film industry and the techniques evolved in the sort of six or seven years? Yeah, that was very interesting it? because it was quite a few years. I think it was between six and eight years. Mm. Unbelievable, really. And that's a long time in the evolution of technology, huge. isn't it? Huge, so. absolutely huge. Mm. It was purely that the, the guy that was assisting the American editor rang me and said, look, Norm, Sean doesn't know, he doesn't know anyone on this film. It's all completely new. If, if you came back, at least he'd have one person he could relate to. And I said, well, I never met Sean. He said, no, no, we didn't figure out it. So anyway, I did decide to go back. And I, I, it was a very unhappy film. But when I first arrived, all my colleagues, former colleagues, said, Norman, this idea of mixing 10 tracks together to make one is all over now. We've got guys now with machines. They'll just look at the screen and they'll make any sound you want. 
So you lose a bit of job satisfaction, don't you, from that point of view? Well, in some yeah. ways, but of course you're always up against time. Mm. Films are made to very strict schedules, and that's the pressure. That's one of the pressures that I don't miss or didn't miss. Mm. Do, do, you, do you find yourself now, when you're watching films, listening to the sound? Very or are you able so. to sit back and watch the film and enjoy yes, the film? Yes, yes. I, in fact, every aspect of film, it takes a lot for me to sit back and become absorbed in films. Mm. And I, I think probably anyone that worked in the industry would say the same. Yeah. I know after about five minutes whether or not it's for me. If I'm mm. watching the cuts and the setups and the sound, it, no, no, forget it. What, what do you think of the way the Bond series has evolved in the, you know, in the last 10, 15 That's years? That's a very interesting question. A lot of people ask that. Originally, From Russia With Love was my favourite, and it was also Covey Brox's favourite. Mm. And I think the reason we both preferred it to all the others was because it was a more direct story. It wasn't going into fantasy land, well, slightly, but basically it was a straightforward story. You could almost believe it could happen. So when Casino Royal came out, I must admit, I said, well, now the whole era has changed, and, and I thought that was a magnificent film. You, I couldn't really fault it. Beautifully directed, a new star, and a good story. Hmm. But. Since then, I'm not too sure. <laughs> well, it's interesting because now it sounds increasingly like Daniel Craig's um, hung up his holster and they're looking for a new Bond now, aren't they? And you come into the, the, the ever um, typical question about do you try and find another Daniel Craig? Do you find Well, this is Connery? true, do yes. What do you think it is that's made the Bond films that, so successful overall? I'm really years? not sure. I'm not actually a Bond fan. I'm interested, like so many people, and it fascinates me that ordinary people like farmers where I live, I say, have you seen the... Oh, yeah, I wouldn't miss the Bond. And I think, what? You know, they're not film goers, yeah. but they never miss the Bonds. Mm. I think... I think the answer is that you know what you're going to get. You know you're going to get a handsome star, lots of beautiful ladies, fantastic locations, amazing stunts, yeah. and it's all going to be there. So all you, you're going to find out is how they've combined all these elements. Don't forget the great sound. That's important. Oh, the great sound. That's important. That now, in more recently, you have been keeping yourself active. That's an understatement, isn't it? T tell us what you did for your, for your 80th, for example. Oh, yeah, well... The thing is that, about, unfortunately, about 20 years ago, my wife passed away. Mm -hmm. So suddenly I became uh, a loner, really. And the fact that my daughter's emigrated and my son lives in Essex, <laughs> I live completely alone in the Midlands. So I've, I've become free to travel. Mm -hmm. And that's become really a very good hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy travel, mm -hmm. especially nowadays. You can go anywhere in the world. And so last year, I looked through the brochure of a company I travel with called Explore, mm. who believe in what you might call adventure holidays, mm. where you go off the beaten track and mm. meet the locals. And I spotted that they were doing the Kilimanjaro climb. And I thought, well, as it's my 80th birthday, I ought to do something it's really memorable. special. <laughs> there it is. That's Look it. That. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. What yeah. was that like? What was that? Did that live up to your expectations? Oh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. It wouldn't be for everybody mm. because you're living, you're living in a very primitive way. You're living mm. in tents and it's very cold mm. at night and so on. But we had an amazing group of people. There yeah, were 16 yeah, of us. Look at that, yeah. And uh, what was so interesting was that we, we, you have to register before you start the climb. Mm. And the leader, the African leader, was standing next to us. And as we wrote down, everyone was writing down their age, 25, 30, 27. And I wrote <laughs> down 79. And I watched his legs. He said, what? So, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of marking milestones, doing, doing memorable things, I mean, you ran the London Marathon at 60, didn't you? Was it 60? Yes, I did. Well, running originally was my hobby. but. Unfortunately, like most runners, there's always your limbs begin to give way. Most dedicated runners one day will have to have a knee replacement or something. And I had a knee replacement. And the guy said, uh, I said, it, would it be all right to run? He said, well, you could, but it will probably loosen it over time. Mm. So I, I do other things. I swim and walk and work out. <laughs> And, and, but the magic, when you're able to, to, to talk to people across any generation and say, I've won an Oscar, and pull that out and say, and talk about your, your, your story in film, it still captivates people, doesn't it? People still want to talk to you about your time on golf. Yes, I, I know what you mean. I mean, for me now, it's history. It's so long mm. ago. You know, when, when they had the 50th year of Bond, I kept saying to people, don't keep mentioning 50 years of Bond, because I was on the first one. <laughs> um, but no, what it is that people often um, 
say, would, would you come and give a talk? And I really enjoy those because it's, it's not to be pompous or boast or anything, but I do love the pleasure people get, not only of hearing how films are made, but to actually see a statuette like mm. that, and it gives them a, a, a big thrill, and I get satisfaction from that. Fabulous. So what's still on the Norman Wonstall bucket list, then? What have you still got that you're looking to tick off? Well, <laughs> Well, I'm 80 now, so I've got to be a little bit cautious. Last year I was in four different countries, one of them being Kilimanjaro, and of course I go to Australia every year. But Because your, your daughter's in the, in the movie business as she well, She was, isn't she? And, yeah. She went to LA. She, she took a course in makeup, even though she was a very highly qualified hairdresser. Mm. Took a course in makeup and went out to LA and worked on some pretty big stuff there. I was quite impressed. And she got an Emmy nomination for Babylon 5. Right, excellent. So yeah, good. and I'm very proud of her for that. But the big problem with working in America is you can't get a green card. Mm. And half the time she was working on, on phony documents, and she said... Right. And, uh, so when my wife became ill, she came back, and she said, I'm not going back working with phony documents. And so she worked here for a long time, in also in film and as a hairdresser and makeup artist. So you've still got so many great reasons to travel. Um, yeah. Have you got anywhere planned for this year yet? Well, I'm very tempted to go to Vietnam because it's been on the top of my list. But what tends to happen is you, you have one at the top of the list and then for some reason it drops down one and then, you, then it goes back up again. And that's been happening for quite a while with Vietnam. And I think this year it's, it's the probably year. the one, yeah. Norman, I could talk to you all day, but time's got the better of us. Thank okay. you so much for joining no us at Big Centre. <laughs> that's all we've got time for, and that's Norman Wanstall, Oscar winner here at Big Centre TV.